Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Chris Parks and Dr. Don Giesting, both of Cargill Animal Nutrition. Hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Doing well. How are you doing? Doing very doing great, well. Laura. Glad to have you on, Don and Chris. Um, for our audience who may not be familiar with, with either of you, let's just have you do a really brief introduction, if you don't mind. Um, Chris, you're first on my screen, so I'll have you go ahead and, and give a brief introduction about yourself. You got it. Uh, I've been with Cargill for about a year and a half now as a swine nutritionist on the tech team. So handle um, working with customers across the country. And then I've got a couple uh, international accounts that we work with in terms of uh, nutrition advice, uh, products, things like that, research, um, all kinds of different activities with them. So for that, I was with Smithfield for about five years as the director of research. So I've kind of been back and forth between the industry and, uh, and the production side. Perfect. Glad to have you on, Chris. Don, how about you? Could you give a little background for us as well? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've been with Cargill 32 years. Uh, I'm trained as a swine nutritionist. Uh, I've spent time working with other species as well. My responsibilities today uh, pretty much apply across uh, additive types that are used in, in animals to improve performance and health. Um, I work on, on uh, product development, uh, advancing offerings for our customers, as well as supporting the deployment and, uh, and doing some training with our, our folks in-house. Perfect. Well, great. Thank you for that introduction, Don, as well. Well, we appreciate having you both on. I think this is a good time of year to, to bring the topic up that we're going to talk about. And of course, that's mycotoxins. Uh, some of our audience may be saying, oh, we've heard all about mycotoxins before. But I think, you know, again, it's we have these conversations every year. What are we looking for? What are the appropriate levels to be concerned about? What are we going to do for interventions? Um, I've even heard some relatively new ones this last year on, on groups that maybe they're feeding straw and the straw might have a mycotoxin that they're not familiar with. And so I think, again, it's good to always kind of come back to these questions and really go back to explore them. So let's just start, particularly since we're getting close to harvest and we're thinking about it, let's start with how mycotoxins impact swine. So can we maybe have one of you just talk a little bit about what we might see in the field and, and why this is important? Don, you want to go ahead and do a deep dive on that one? <laughs> well, do you want I'll me to handle off. kind of the production I'll, side? How's I'll that? start <laughs> off with a with a few uh, general comments, and you can you can fill in from yeah. your your production experience. So, uh, yeah, mycotoxins, as we know, are a, a diverse group, and and as Laura ind indicated, you know, every year is is kind of a new circus because we're not quite sure uh, who all the performers are going to be. Um, we've got uh, probably five primary mycotoxins that we spend most of our time being concerned with in the U.S. and and can probably narrow it down a little bit more than that even for swine. Uh, you know, two of the big ones are uh, are Don and Zeralinone. They're they're both fusarial toxins and and can be very problematic for for both uh, growing and reproducing animals. Uh, aflatoxin is always a concern because it's a super potent mycotoxin, uh, carcinogenic, and in chronic uh, effects can can really be deleterious to the to the to the animal at almost any age, but especially young animals. And then fumonisin is one that tends to hang around there, and uh, I think a lot of times exacerbates problems that we're having with other toxins. So. So those are, are four of the primary ones and, and we can see production challenges in terms of just, you know, poor doing pigs, poorly can, poorly performing pigs, pigs that just don't look very bright, pigs that aren't eating very well. Uh, and then of course we, we see various changes in reproduction that are often signals of, of mycotoxins or at least a, a reason to think about mycotoxins. They may not be definitive. Chris, what observations would you add to that? 
Yeah, you, you hit on the high points, and I think those are the classic signs that, that many of us look for. Um, we're all waiting on harvest right now. It started in the southeastern part of the state here in North Carolina, and then it'll spread a little north from here and then obviously west. So we're all kind of waiting to see what we get. Uh, besides the classic signs of high levels, I think more of what we're we're looking for too is is those chronic lower levels of mycotoxins. We're moving into a stage now, you know, my philosophy has changed on this, you know, what I consider high levels. You obviously have bad years, you know, we've had a bad year in vomitoxin in the Eastern Corn Belt before, things like that. But you also, you start to think, you know, what are the low level concerns, especially when you mentioned some of the, the alternative feed ingredients, what are we, what are we missing? What are we not looking for? That's really, you know, what we're going to have to pay attention to and to with that performance. And, and you mentioned immune suppression. I think, you know, a lot of but things go along with that, that again, that low level chronic exposure to these things. It may not be a frank condition in the field. It may be slightly decreased feed intake, for example. You're never really gonna catch it in terms of closeouts, um, but it doesn't mean it's, it's not there. So I think that's probably where I'm moving into more concern now is not just the big exciting story of what's happening, but it's that backstory, you know, that, that it's always happening now. I think I don't think we'll ever have a year where you have zero mycotoxins. That that that's long gone now. So so it's just how much and what are we going to see? Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right. I actually had that conversation with the nutritionist yesterday. Was are you always going to think about mycotoxins every year? And I said yes. From now on, that's exactly what we're seeing. And and I like how you both talked about you know the different players potentially in this year's circus versus next year because I think that's that's very important. You both alluded to the potentially low levels of various mycotoxins where one may not be standing out, but yet they're all interacting or they're all playing on different body parts, organs, immune system, whatever it may be, and it's impacting those pigs. And so let's maybe start with some of those interactions because I think that's where it gets really confusing for folks. Um, because like you said, Chris, we always focus on the biggest player, but those interactions really can be a little bit tricky to decipher what we're dealing with. So, um, Don, you had mentioned, you know, xeralanone and, and vomitoxin or, or DON, as most of us might know it, as being two of those that we really focus on, particularly with reproduction and, and grow finished pigs. And so let's talk about those interactions a little bit. Can either one of you maybe allude to how they interact with each other and what types of effects we might anticipate? Yeah, I could I can start a little bit with that. Um, you know, xeralanone is is kind of the you know the classic uh, mycotoxin that that we think of in in causing reproductive problems. You know, it it uh, it's an estrogen like compound. It's not a it's not an estrogen, but it it acts like it. And and there's some evidence that it kind of interacts with natural hormones and and probably uh, acts almost synergistically to cause kind of an overproduction or an overdevelopment of of reproductive tissues or in in a developing guilt uh, um, development of the reproductive. Um, uh, apparatus, if you will, <laughs> a reproductive system. Um, Don is is more subtle in relation to uh, to reproduction, but uh, there is some recent indication that it, it probably has some some limited direct effects on the reproductive tract, but it also has has big effects on uh, you know it it's always going to cause feed intake uh, responses and and of course in in uh, lactating animals, particularly, that's that's problematic, um, and will exacerbate any any reproductive issues. Um, and they, you know, the effects on the immune system that both uh, compounds can produce, you know, can basically complicate uh, health and and reproductive success in general. So that's that's some of how they they kind of work together in the sow. Yeah, some of those uh, we're starting to think about too, the combinations early on uh, in an animal's life and what impact that has on it, 
you know, for lifetime performance, whether reproductive performance, I know Don's had some evidence about zoralinone exposure early on, can have an impact, you know, way down, down the road in terms of the animal when you actually may not be seeing it then. So, you know, it, it, we got to think beyond just a one-time situation where we had some, you know, exposure and then, and then we're off and running. I think Don is the same way. It, it damages the GI tract, things like that, that are long-term. Some of those, the animal's not going to get past. It's going to impact that animal performance-wise, although, you know, throughout its lifetime. So th that's where the combinations come into, into play, is, especially, and again, Don and Zeralanone is a great one. You tend to find those together, um, you know, when you're dealing with that. So what is it, is it doing to that animal early on that then impacts for lifetime performance? I think that's probably a, a newer, bigger area we need to study moving forward. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. You both alluded to zeralinone having this reproductive impact, and, and Chris, you also mentioned maybe a little bit longer than the immediate. Right? Most of us, if we go out, we see a swollen vulva, we think right now. So what are we finding out with zeralinone and, and what it's actually doing in the body and, and what maybe some of these lifelong impacts might be? What are some recent developments that we're hearing? Yeah, I think uh, one of the one of the paradigm shifts I'm seeing is just, you know, thinking about zeralinone almost as, as no safe level. I think in the past we used to think about, you know, a part per million or more before we got very concerned. But but some of the, the work that's been done, particularly in Europe in the last half a dozen years or so has shown, you know, levels that are down in that, uh, you know, non-action level, but with chronic exposure, you know, leading to, um, you know, reductions in lifetime reproductive performance, changes in reproductive tract, um, you know, some ovarian uh, damage, uh, fewer uh, ova being shed over the lifetime of the, of the female, and, you know, some fairly interesting work that's been done, you know, even looking at uh, the next generation where feeding feeding zeralinone or exposing uh, sows to zeralinone and then checking in their offspring and finding that that they also are producing uh, that have fewer fewer oocytes uh, when they reach sexual maturity so it's uh, you know suggesting that that we've probably underestimated the impact of zeralinone and as you said, Laura, we, we tend to look for swollen vulva and, and external symptoms, but we we're just learning about these some of these chronic effects, I think. Yeah. Don hit on a great point years ago. I mean, some of the older research, you wouldn't be concerned about it until it hit, like you said, one ppm or greater. So if if things were happening below that level in the feed, I I basically didn't have any concern at that point. But but at this point now you start to see some of the research in the much lower levels that, that these animals respond to. It changes how you look at things in the big picture from a spot treatment situation. Let's say we're going to treat the feed right now because we think we have a problem to going long-term strategy, you know, having something in that feed always there, you know, to take care of these issues and address the issues, you know, when they, when they occur, because you just can't predict when that's going to happen. I mean, you can take one load of feed, analyze it 10 times and get 10 different numbers. So I think that's that's been the biggest eye opener for me in the last couple of years is these things are responding to much lower levels um, of mycotoxins, especially with this raunone in, in the reproducing animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of worked off a, a fairly low number of about 250 parts per billion for my females. But that's what's intriguing to me is this recent work or relatively recent work that's suggesting that it's intergenerational. I mean, again, we've, we've learned so much about nutrition and the impact of maybe a malnutrition event during fetal development that can impact generations thereafter. And so this is intriguing, right? This is another one of these steps or pieces that we maybe didn't think about, but they're real, right? And they're happening and we need to think about something beyond the immediate. So that's really intriguing to me. It makes sense logically, but it wasn't something that I connected to, to other information. So I think, you know, that 
that's obviously concerning and, and you all, have, we've kind of talked a lot about reproduction, but at the beginning there, Don, when you talked a little bit about mycotoxins, you alluded to some other things. You alluded to the fact that mycotoxins can suppress the immune system and, um, you know, have other challenges. And so let's, let's kind of jump over to the immune suppression for a minute. How do mycotoxins do this? Yeah, so one of the, you know, there's, there's so many mycotoxin effects that are different uh, across different mycotoxins. One of the things that's closest to common is, is immune suppression uh, and inflammation. So inflammation is, is one of the big effects on the immune system that uh, uh, is, is, is caused, I guess, directly by mycotoxins. Um, but also macrophage phagocytes in general tend to be suppressed by, by some mycotoxins. Uh, T and B cell levels are, are, uh, reduced by some mycotoxins that includes, um, xeralinone, thimonosin, uh, Don, several of those have been tested. A lot of the testing has been done in, in cell cultures and things of that type. So whether they all, uh, correlate perfectly back to in vivo aren't all defined yet, but, but again, it's a pretty, pretty common, uh, relationship there. Um, and then, you know, in some cases, some of these mycotoxins will cause frankly cell death or higher level of apoptosis. So, so that, you know, obviously is part of how they damage organs and part of how they damage mucosal tissues and, and have effects at the gut level. Mm -hmm. So Chris, as you're listening to that, you think back to your, your production nutrition hat, what does that tell you? What are you concerned about when you hear the words immune suppression? You think of immune suppression, what do you, in what Don mentioned that you, you throw in that cytokine cascade is interrupted. Um, things like that'll happen. The, in production side, think about vaccine efficacy. That's a, that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, we, we tend to think we, you know, we apply the vaccine, we should be good to go and we move on. That's one I, there's data out there. I was reading some a little while back on vomitoxin, you know, that interferes with the ability for the vaccine to, to work properly or actually the animal to uptake the vaccine and process it properly because you're interfering with the immune system and different things in, in that animal. So that's an area we probably don't think about much at all. You know, you never connect the two dots on that one, but simple production things that we're, we're doing, everyday production, um, practices are going to be impacted by these mycotoxins. So that's that's probably the one of the larger ones I think about in terms of, of animal health and production. You know, is what was that what else is it interfering with? You know, not just the basic performance and feed intake, but yeah, big term, you know, longer, longer term, bigger picture type things. Well certainly when I hear immune suppression, I worry about disease susceptibility, right? How how more how more likely are they essentially to develop a disease, uh, not be able to push off that E. coli challenge or that strep challenge, and it becomes overwhelming rather than being a morbidity, it becomes a mortality event. And so immune suppression is, is obviously a big one, but I also heard Don talk in there about inflammation. And so when I hear the word inflammation, I think about oxidation events, oxidative stress, and so immediately go to antioxidants. So let's Talk about antioxidants and um, and this inflammation event that could be occurring with mycotoxins. What do we what do we know today? Yeah. So yeah, as we as we observe the the inflammation, then you kind of activate the antioxidants to help clean up, you know, the peroxides that are part of of inflammation and and some of the cytokines. You know, and you know, so you're putting a higher drain on the on the antioxidant status, but likewise, mycotoxins tend to uh, reduce the antioxidant status as well. So your your machinery is going to be uh, running low on fuels quicker than than you'd like it to, uh, which can lead to more chronic inflammation. Uh, you know, higher levels of cell death and tissue damage again because the the antioxidant uh, repair may not be <laughs> may not be sufficient to overcome come the inflammation. Um, 
you know, the other thing to keep in mind is all of this stuff is is crossing, you know, the mucosa and antioxidant function at the mucosal level is super important to to gut health, to nutrient efficiency, to to animal performance. And so if we're creating either a chronic inflammation or or a frank inflammation that that ends up in damage to the to the mucosa and we can't fully offset it with antioxidants then you know we're, we're going to have a, a pretty serious cascade of uh, chronic effects on the animal yeah that kind of changes your approach to how you think about it too so you have the initial mycotoxin itself that you've got to address in terms of whether you're trying to bind it or or, or you know, break it down but then you've got to address it from a a nutrition standpoint from a recovery standpoint you know your your traditional levels of vitamins and minerals you know and, and antioxidants may be okay in normal situations but you may have like don said you may have drained the bank you know going through these these situations so you have to you know pivot to the second point which is recovery you know how do you get that gut to recover how do you get that animal to recover from the initial assault so i think you're seeing a a change in attitude about how we approach these these situations in the field now so that was going to be my question. Do we have any research or even field observations today where increasing antioxidants when we have higher levels of mycotoxins have reduced impact or clinical symptoms or anything of that nature? Do we have any of that data currently? So uh, we have, you know, a, a preservative product uh, that uh, that we use in in or recommend to people when mycotoxins are, are a challenge, especially uh, uh, with Don and, and Zeralinone. And, and we did a study oh, four years ago now, probably, and you know the, the sodium metabisulfite, I'll just <laughs> indicate what the primary active is there, uh, does a good job of changing the structure of Don and, and mitigating its effect on the pig. But we found that adding uh, above, you know, a, a good dose of vitamin E and and uh, uh, organic selenium source and so forth, we still were able to get a, a benefit over and above the effect of the sodium metabisulfite when we added, uh, in this case, kind of a phytogenic source of antioxidants. So a specific set of, of plant derivatives that are uh, have antioxidant functions that are complementary to vitamin E and and separate from from the vitamin E effects. We've also seen some some situations where raising the vitamin E level will also uh, help with that. Although we think we can go further with a combination than we can with simply raising the vitamin E level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you for that. I was not aware of that research, so that's actually very helpful. I'll have to go. Do a yeah, little bit more digging. <laughs> they're abstract. I don't think we've, we've gotten it into a fully reviewed uh, paper at this point. Okay. Well, that's very interesting, though. Very good. Well, we've kind of bounced around a little bit. We've talked levels. We've talked about how there's impact. But, you know, let's talk threshold. Let's get down to the nitty gritty because that's really where I get asked all the time is when do we intervene? When do we not? What's acceptable? And so, what would you suggest in terms of those questions around thresholds? Chris, you want to start this time? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it from a off-the-cuff production standpoint. Um, I guess I've just fallen into the to, to a few areas where I just look to vomitoxin. I don't tend to get excited until we get to that one and a half to two ppm. It's probably that range. That, that doesn't mean it's not having issues below that. It is. Um, we've seen, you know, that threshold of one PPM really and below, you can have some impact there, no doubt about it. I guess for Frank, big concern, if we're looking for that, like right now at harvest, that's what I'm thinking, where, where is this going to land? Um, but I'd probably say at the end of the day now, one PPM, which you're going to almost, I don't know how you get away from not having that at this point. Like we talked about, you find it about everything enough to, to hit that level. Um, you get to three to the five, three to five PPM, I'm starting to really actually get kind of concerned big time that we've got a real big problem um, at that point. Zeralno, we talked about that, you know, I, I'm decreasing it, you know, as I go through my career, I started off probably that one PPM, I'm down in that 250 to 500, you know, at least um, at that range now for concern. 
Um, aflatoxin is an interesting one because I'd probably be more concerned. It's got immune suppression impacts, but there's a federal side, uh, a, you know, a, a regulatory side to that one too. So from a feed mill standpoint, you've got some levels that obviously you have to watch regardless of how you feel it impacts the animal. You know, 20 parts per, parts per billion in, in a young animal, that is the limit, you know, in, in corn and other ingredients like that. So that sets the tone for it. Um, so at that level, you really have to start thinking about what's going on there. So, so that's just more of an off the cuff. Those are what I'm looking for initially, you know, as harvest comes through, where does that sit? And then you start to make plans kind of based on that. What about fumonacin, Chris? Do you take that one into account? Yeah, more and more now than I ever did. Um, fumonacin one, if you look at some of the older research, um, you know, some of the signs you're looking for, you know, pulmonary edema and sows, things like that, which we, we don't tend to see as much. You may see that out there. We've had areas I know in the past that have been five to eight, you know, PPM of that, if not higher. Um, I think that's probably if you had to pick a sleeper, that's the sleeper one in terms of impact. So we don't fully yet understand what is it doing to sows. Um, there's some other impacts that it can have. I believe we talked to one yesterday, Don and I did about a heart attack. You know, that's one we don't tend to think about, you know, and who diagnoses a heart attack when a sow has sudden death, you know, I, that's one of those, again, a sleeper that I have to think there's more to it than we know right now. And so it's, you're, you're starting to see more groups test for it. We certainly test for it. Um, but I think you're going to start to see more and more research around that. That was something I always noticed, you know, between the years with the crops, the fumonacin was creeping up, but yet my other three, the vomitoxin, zerelinone, and aflatoxin were all below what I would consider thresholds, which are similar to the numbers you talked about. I could still walk in a barn and see zerelinone. Right, it's the necrotic tails and missing skin on piglets being born, and and yet those levels were notoriously low. We measure them every month, but fumonacin was always there and present. Exactly. <laughs> and so I, I agree. Uh, yeah. I think that is the sleeper, right? And it, for me, in my experience, it almost tends to magnify the other mycotoxins that are present. And that's not fair, right? Because we know it does its own thing too, but. Um, I agree. I think it is that sleeper that sometimes takes us down the wrong path almost. Yep. Yeah. There's been some unknowns that we've had that you just can't quite put your finger on, but you know, there's, it's in the background there. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, we, we've had situations where your general feed samples, or your general ingredient samples weren't really showing much, you know, but they may have bought an offload or three or four offloads of off spec, some, something else and just dumped them in the corn, for example. Um, that may have come through as a slug and bam, you have your issues, but you'd never catch it. You right. never find it. And so I Absolutely. think there's a, you know, more of that probably goes on than we realize, but that's probably the big one for me trying to figure out moving forward. There's, there's things going on in sales that just don't make sense. You know, they're, they're not making sense. So no. <laughs> there's gotta be something else there. That's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, Laura, I think you're alluding to it. You know, what you're saying about fumonacin is is good. I think what Chris has alluded to in terms of if you've got more than one of those toxins, you know, to me, it's, you know, <laughs> you're a whole lot more sensitive, a lot more concerned, you know, you're a lot more concerned with, with two or 300 parts per million of zeralinone if you've got, you know, a part per million of Don on top of that. And in our experience surveying corn crops, if you've got two or 300 parts of Z, you almost always have a part per million of Don. You know, they, you rarely see a, a zeralinone effect without, without Don. You know, again, if you're carrying around three or 4,000 uh, PPB of, of fumonacin on top of, you know, a little bit of uh, zeralinone and Don, you know, you've got to be pretty conscious of that and, and, and look out for your sour. So, yeah, I think that's the big, watch out and trying to define these and and the one other thing i i often talk to people about when it comes to thresholds is just don't fall in love with that first analysis that came in where you wanted it to <laughs> and assume you're good for the next year because oh, the reality man. is <laughs> you know as chris yeah. alluded to things happen you know people buy ingredients people have bad spots in their bins and so forth and and 
you know, we're talking, you know, we've, you've heard the analogy about, you know, we're looking for grains of sand on the beach here, right? So parts per billion is not very much. And so, you know, the, the variation around our analyses, the, the challenge of really getting repeatable and meaningful data is, is really tough. So, you know, the more you test, the, the better your number, even though uh, you'll see a lot of variation around it. So, uh, you know, don't don't assume that uh, you know, 200 parts per billion is okay, even if you're tracking at 250, because chances are, you know, a sample a couple of yards away in that bin might have been three or four or 500 parts per billion just as easily. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's some of the reason why people are so hesitant to even measure mycotoxins, because the argument is, is well, what's one test going to tell me? And, and like you all mentioned, I encourage people to just routinely sample and not necessarily focus so much on the number, right? I understand the number is probably your range, but look more for the trends and patterns, right? What's increasing, what's decreasing, or is it staying relatively stable as you're pulling from the bin year round? So I would agree with that. Well, Chris, you also threw out that conversation about you never know what's what else is there. And, and that's something I think we've talked about a little bit in the past, but I really want to come back to it, is this concept around masked mycotoxins. And, and so I'd like for you all to maybe take a moment and explain what masked mycotoxins are, and then why should we be concerned about them? So from a definition standpoint, and, you know, we, I guess that term's been used as much as, as any, but... People have to understand that, uh, you know, mycotoxins are, you know, they're, of course, complex molecules. And as a plant is affected by a mold and maybe has mycotoxins, there are actually actions that a plant can take that modify the mycotoxin to make it less toxic to the plant. So this is true for uh, Zeralinone, it's true for Don, it's true for Fumonacin, where, and the most common modification the plant makes is, is to add a glucose unit to it. So uh, uh, there, there are, and in turn, now you've got a modification of that toxin. And when you do the analysis, by particularly quick tests, but even even if you're doing uh, doing a lab based analysis, you're you're going to have a different peak, right? So because the compound now has a different molecular weight, uh, it comes off uh, uh, differently and is going to be measured or not measured actually. So, but the reality is this mass mycotoxin can then be modified in the animal. So the animal may take that glucose unit off and now voila, you're back to uh, to full-fledged Don or Xeralinone or Fumonacin. So that's just kind of an example of how a, a mass mycotoxin works and what it is. I think that brings us back to that question then or that example of, of really showing us that whatever you're testing, your, your assay might be missing something else. Right. And so using the animal to also tell us what's going on is going to still be one of the most important things we can do um, at the end of the day. The other the other conversation I want to kind of bring up here is we're talking about nuances or things we don't think about. You know, we've talked about the top five mycotoxins or four mycotoxins, but there's a group that I hear once in a while, but they're not really talked much about. And that's like they're called the T2s. That's how I hear them. I cannot pronounce the word if you ask me <laughs> what their official name is. It took me forever to learn how to say xeralanone and fumonacin. So let's let's kind of jump into those. What are the T2s? How do they play into this game? Should we be thinking about them, et cetera? Yep. So so T2s are are uh are in the trichothecene family. I think that might be the word you're alluding alluding to. So uh, trichothecenes kind of break into two big groups that are problematic. So the T2, HT2, uh, DAS is another acronym for a word that is is about a half mile long. Um, and 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 those toxins have particular impact. Um, 
they affect protein synthesis, RNA, uh, DNA, <laughs> uh, trans translation and transcription and so forth. So they they but they have an effect on the GI tract from from top to bottom, and um, so they can they can cause some some damage to the to the mucosa. And you know, as Chris and I were talking recently, it's particularly commonly seen in poultry where you see mouth lesions. I think in the pig, uh, it must get further in the GI tract, and so you don't necessarily see the lesions. But but they're fairly, uh, you know, they're pretty toxic compounds. They don't occur with quite the frequency uh, the, of, of Don, which is kind of in the other family, the B family of uh, trichothecenes. But, uh, but, but T2 and HT2 are, are pretty bad actors, and, and you see them periodically uh, crop up. Uh, they're also uh, fusarial toxins, although generally produced by a different species of mold than, than the Don and, and uh, yeah. Zorellano. That, that's one that as as pig people we don't tend to pay as much attention to like you mentioned it's, it's more you think of poultry we when you think of t2 but i mean at high levels there, there's evidence out there of vomiting in, in pigs things like that and, and what don mentioned about the the dna and um synthesis and all that you think of of fast turnover cells any cell that's turning over you know quickly mucosal cells along the gut lining which is turning over every few days um, around the you know, skin cells around the mouth, but you think of the gut now. So, so if that's affecting, you know, cell turnover and things in that area, then again, unknown impact from something that we really probably don't pay attention to. Doesn't mean it's not happening in that animal, but again, it's not on the radar really. You know, that's not, we test for it here and there, but I don't know how often any producers ask me about well, what about T2 levels? Have we been watching? No, I mean, it just doesn't come up. But at the same time, it's having an impact on that animal. So. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I'm one of those that's really guilty of that. You get your mycotoxin report and go, oh, there's T2s. Don't yeah. really know what they're doing in the pig. <laughs> they're there. Yeah. We'll just leave them alone. Yeah, right? that's a chicken thing. You don't worry yeah, about it. Yeah, it's a chicken thing. But it, it's a good point. We don't know what it's doing down the stream from, from the mouth. And so clearly there might be something that we need to be considering. Yeah. Laura, you had alluded to, you know, the interaction of disease and mycotoxins. I think this is one where I haven't, I don't think it's been as well documented in pigs, but definitely in dairy cows, there's been some evidence that T2 can have a contributing effect on um, hemorrhagic bowel type of, you know, diseases. So these complexes that are, you know, resulting in, in, uh, you know, bloody diarrheas and damage, you know, frank damage to to the ileum and, and lower GI tract, you know, probably a, a contributor, at least at times. Again, probably not the, the primary cause in, in some cases, but again, these toxins, I often think of stressors that, <laughs> you know, when you pile one stressor on top of another, whether those are multiple toxins or whether those are you know, disease organisms on top of toxins, on top of an immune system that's stressed, you're just at a higher risk of, of you know, frank disease problems occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's probably not something we want people to start associating hemorrhagic bowel with T2, mm -hmm. but <laughs> you, you never know, right? So you never know. it's always something to, I guess, put in the in the hat with everything else. Well, gentlemen, I see our time is is really wrapping up, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to visit with you surrounding mycotoxins, certainly helping our producers get ready for the fall and, and anything that may come with harvest. And I um, want to ask first if there's any last words or pieces of advice that you would like to share with our audience. I guess I'd go with the old Boy Scout saying is a be prepared. <laughs> That's how I always look at it. We're all kind of watching crop reports now, trying to wait and see what's going to happen. It's be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, it, we just don't know. So hopefully it'll be quiet, but you just don't know. So it's true. I would just say that yeah, the the front end, the first month after harvest, wherever you are, <laughs> you know, sample heavily. Uh, widely and and as you alluded to invest a little bit in in figuring out you know your t2 levels and your fumonisin levels as well as your your don and zorelinone and aflatoxin to make sure that you really get a picture of what 
what your next year is going to bring to bring to bear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those are very good pieces of advice. Well, we've done in the past our, our typical questions and, and you all have answered them remarkably well, but I'm going to ask just one of the two or the three questions today as we wrap up. And that's around, you know, are you reading anything today that you would recommend to our audience? I wouldn't call it, it's reading, but it's keeping up with, um, Don and I were talking about it, keeping up with things that are on the regulatory side. That's probably where I, I, the interest lies the most right now is what's going to change with that, um, you know, different administrations, different funding, what's going to change on that end. So keeping up with AFCO reports, um, presentations there, uh, FDA reports, information on their website, things like that. That to me right now is probably more favored reading <laughs> to keep keep up with that. Um, inspections are definitely increasing is what I've been hearing. So, you know, through the FISMA uh, structure, there's definitely more, more um, surveillance going on. So anytime you can read in those areas and understand what's going on, it's probably a good thing for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah I think with greater funding of, of FDA and, uh, you know, there's, I, I think there's more communication among regulatory agencies, but, you know, Canada, the U.S., Europe, and so forth. So I think while it'll be a while, there there's generally, you know, some of the best practices will eventually evolve. There'll be some development of, we hope, uh, some, <laughs> some categories somewhere between feed ingredients and drugs that are they're more helpful for us. So, so I'm, I'm kind of with Chris, I, I, I keep a pretty close eye on, on uh, the regulatory landscape right now. Well, very good. Well, I do want to thank you both for your time today. Again, for our audience, this is Dr. Chris Parks and Dr. Don Geesting, both of Cargill Animal Nutrition. Thank you both and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.